it has been a little while um, since I have been on here and since we have produced um, some content at the time that I'm doing this recording. And we give God thanks for the ability and the opportunity to continue to share and teach his message. We are truly in the vanguard and we have many challenges to face and we have a mighty savior who is pulling us through and at the same time qualifying us to be a part of the house of David. So, <clears throat> With no further ado, we will move into our subject for this study. This is entitled Trademark Rights, Part 1. There is also a Part 2, uh, which will be recorded and produced as well. And there's much, much that uh, is involved here. Um, but as we go through this study, more will be explained. Now, our prayer thought. It says, <clears throat> the selfish. <clears throat> forgive me. Let me repeat. The selfish, the proud and the lovers of sin are ever assailed with doubts. So this is a category that we do not want to be in. We do not want to be in the category of those who are ever assailed with doubts. The rod says that to doubt is the greatest offense. Now, the statement is indicating that or implying that the reason that they are in doubt is because of their selfishness, their pride, and their love of sin. So in order for us to have faith, these things must be expelled from the soul by the power of Christ. We'll continue. Satan has ability to suggest doubts and devise objections. Hmm. Now, we have to understand that this is something that Satan does. While God's work is going forward, Satan has the ability to suggest doubt. So he can bring into the situation something by which we are to doubt the goodness or justice of God, right? And God's association. <clears throat> so he can suggest these doubts, suggest things that would cause us to doubt whether God is true, God is right, God's association is right. And on top of that, um, to devise objections. So now after he, um, or in the process of creating the doubt, um, maybe prior to, he's devising a, an objection. He's saying this is not correct because of that, right? And we know that we do not see Satan physically. We do not see him walking around and talking with people, but he is. he has an influence. So how does he have an influence? Well, he has an army of evil spirits and we don't even see them but we see the people who they work through at the time that they work through them. So this is the way that Satan suggests doubts and devises objections. It's through people. And it has to be people who are coming in contact with us because if they were not coming in contact with us, what if we were not, we were not being exposed to what they, were it's saying or teaching, <clears throat> then it wouldn't be relevant or effective. So it's going to be people who are in communication with the church and also in the church, we are told at this stage, we have tares 
in the church and those who are working under satanic influence. There are two opposing influences constantly being um, exerted upon the members of the church. So what is he um, suggests doubts and devise objections against. He suggests doubts and devises objections to the pointed testimony that God sends. So God sends a testimony about, um, about Christ and what Christ wants us to do. This is the testimony, um, this is a testimony of Christ, sorry, um, about the truth. This is God telling, teaching us the truth, the present truth, right? Um, testifying of himself, which really is the way that he wants us to go, what he wants us to do, right? And this is what Satan is opposing. But many think it a virtue, a mark of intelligence in them to be unbelieving and to question and quibble. Now they are being unbelieving because the truth is coming from the word of God. So for them to oppose that is to disbelieve the word of God or to be an unbeliever, to be unbelieving. However, those who desire to die, and I'm just adding <clears throat> different <clears throat> interjections here um, to help to read the statement. However, those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. So while this process is going on, God is not going to um, stop people from doubting his, his, his message or aspects of the message. He's not going to try to stop people from having these doubts. God does not propose to remove all occasion for unbelief. So while um, Eve was in the garden, she had plenty of room to doubt because the tree was there and um, the serpent was there. And the, and the serpent could suggest many different thoughts. So she had plenty of room. God is in the business of not being a restrictive, constraining um, taskmaster, but a savior, one who gives his creatures liberty and ex and gives them the power to experience love and truth. So he gives us plenty of room. Um, and he is not going to remove all occasion for unbelief. No, if this, if this, if there's one thing that could cause somebody, oh, this, this looks like it's not, he's not going to go and just say, I'm going to, this, no, I'm not going to, people say, I'm not going to believe because of this, because of this. Oh, let me, he's like, let me go and take away all these things. No. Those are hooks, right? God is not going to remove all of those hooks. People have to make a choice and have to think through things fairly, justly, and rationally based upon the word of God. If we cannot um, willingly and intelligently offer God a sacrifice, it is not acceptable, says the spirit of prophecy. So, we have to be able to willingly serve him and to intelligently serve him. Continuing, he gives evidence. You see evidence. So this is why we go to studies because we are examining God's evidence. He gives evidence, which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit. This is what is needed. But if we go back to the top, the selfish, the proud, and the lovers of sin are always assailed with doubts. But God's true people or his sheep, his little flock, have a humble mind and a teachable spirit. That's how they're able to stay safely in the sheepfold. This is what he does. And all should decide from the weight of evidence. So by God's grace, we are going to study learn and accept the weight of evidence today let's have a word of prayer <clears throat> dear heavenly father we thank you for all you have done for us we thank you for your word your truth technology the ability to share the word and we just pray that your throne and your truth and your righteousness may be exalted above everything else we pray that um, your name will be honored your truth will be honored that we would be vessels of honor and that we would be expositors of the truth dear god help us to be pure in heart and in mind and sound in judgment 
In the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, in this study, we are going to examine the background of trademark law and why trademark law exists and what that all has to do with the message. But prior to even going there, we need to cover a basic concept, which is the relevance of civil government to Christianity and the message. And what the Christian's position is pertaining to civil government. And what that what the prophetic context of that is in regards to the rod message. Because there are fanatical views out there about how we understand civil government and what our position should be as Davidians and how we work within that framework. So we are going to look at the weight of evidence on this subject first. Now, in track number 13, we see track number 13, page 33 and 34. This is what we are told. And we see an image right here of the Ten Commandments, right? Now, in this passage, we are told, we see that while on the one hand, a man's disloyalty to the divine government is a sin against God. On the other hand, his disloyalty to his nation's government is a sin against it. Also indirectly against God. So what we are seeing here is that the message is drawing a parallel between the government of God and the civil government. What we are seeing is that there needs to be a respect for the civil government as one respects the divine government. Now that has some qualifications and we are gonna explore that, but we see here that that parallel is being drawn. And if it is a sin indirectly against God, it means that it's a sin against the Ten Commandments. It means it's a sin against this, these holy precepts. That's what that means. Now, he goes to say why. For disloyalty to one's government is disobedience to God's express command. So whatever God tells us to do is our law. And when we go contrary to that, that is a sin. Titus chapter three and verse one, the Bible says, put them in mind. What the apostle is, 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 is saying here is teach them, remind them, put it in their minds. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates. Those are judges, basically. To be ready to every good work. And that, and that implies that these principalities and powers and magistrates have good work for Christians to do. Their laws are what Christians are to obey. That is a good work. Submit, now we have another Bible verse, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. For whose sake? For whose sake are we to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man? For the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him. By who? by God. This is what Peter is saying. So Peter is saying that these people in their office are ministers of God. They were sent by God. 
So he's so they're just covering different. When Peter and Paul are saying they're covering different, they're saying that the judge, the king, the governor, this, the government agencies, we're not to limit them. He's they're they're just giving, they're saying principalities and powers to obey man. You see, they're 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 um, establishing a broad scope here. <clears throat> and we are to um submit ourselves to these ordinances as as what unto them that are sent by him for what the punishment of evildoers so these um governing bodies and individuals are sent by god for the punishment of evil doers is that a good thing that is a great thing they are there to punish evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. And they're there to praise well doers. This is a basic function of human government that God has put in place, that God has allowed. But ye say, we know there is a but. There is a but, right? But ye say, According to Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 3, in regards to Syria, that her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges, and her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bone till the morrow. And the message says, them gnawing not the bone till tomorrow, they have more than what they know how to do with. They have more than what they can deal, what they can do with. So they don't have to eat it until tomorrow, right? They don't have to eat the bones until tomorrow. Now, we contend that this is true. There is, there is corruption in government, especially in Assyria, but it doesn't matter. And why do I say that it doesn't matter? Let's go to the next slide. This is when we go to the weight of evidence. It says that God is the head of all good and just governments and laws. Not that Everything is perfect, but God is the head of all good and just governments and laws. So is there a possibility that there are unjust laws? Yes, that is possible because the kingdoms of this world are not the kingdom of Christ. They are not the kingdom of Christ. Therefore, there is a balancing a balanced understanding that Christians must have. Now we can give some examples of unjust laws. Okay. <clears throat> what about laws legalizing homosexual um, unions and calling it a marriage? Of course, a Christian would not honor that law. A Christian cannot honor that law. A Christian minister cannot partake in such a, um, a ceremony, right? Or a law uh, making people slaves? Can a Christian um, own own slaves? No. Can a, should a Christian participate in re returning the slave to his owner? No. The spirit of prophecy says that that the, the person has no right to to own that human being. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and there are other um, laws that may arise, which would not be in accordance with the law of God. And what are Christians to do in that situation? Let us look. It says, God's authority being supreme, right? So God's authority is higher than the authority of men, right? God's authority being supreme and absolute, altogether Christians, will prefer homage to the king of heaven and earth, right? So we prefer. So if there is an issue where there is a contradiction, we prefer our homage 
to God if we have to make a choice while faithfully seeking to render unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's and unto God the things which be God's. So we are to at the same time prefer homage to God, right? But at, this, but, but at the same time, we are seeking to render unto Caesar the things which belong to Caesar. We're not going to render to Caesar the things that belong to God, right? We're not going to worship Caesar, but we're not going to take Caesar over God. But the things that belong to Caesar, we will give it to Caesar. If Caesar has taxes, we will pay them. <clears throat> Continuing, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. That is what we will do as altogether Christians. All such will owe no man anything, so long as their debtors' demands or requirements conflict not with God's laws and statutes. That is the condition. We will owe no man anything. We will meet our debtors' demands as long as they do not conflict with God's laws and statutes, as long as that. As altogether Christians, they will be as true to God and to man as was Daniel and as was Joseph. Now, <clears throat> Daniel and Joseph were servants and, and government ministers. Daniel had a situation where he, where a law was passed that he, that he could not worship God, but he did not obey that law. But all the other laws that were not in, that were not sinful or not contradictory to God's laws, he obeyed in the heathen government. That is an example of a true Christian who would today be a true Davidian. <clears throat> so every Christian who would be obedient to God's commands must be loyal to the country in which he lives. That's it. If we want to be an obedient Davidian, we must be loyal to the country in which we live. Wherefore, as Christians in America, now this is a special component of it because this is where the headquarters of the message is. So this is another component that has to come into our minds. Wherefore, as Christians in America, devoted to God, and consequently loyal to the just principles of this free government under God, we pledge our hearts, our minds, our hands, our all first to the flag of God's eternal kingdom. Amen. And to the theocracy for which it stands, one people made up of all nations, bound by the cords of everlasting love, liberty, purity, justice, peace, happiness, light, and life for all. Amen. That first art is our first allegiance. But second, as Americans, to the flag of the United States of America and the republic for which it stands. So the flag and the republic, the government for which that flag stands. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, this quote about there being liberty and justice for all is an essential component of the constitutional framework and the legal um, framework of this nation. And it is an essential part of the church's existence also. So we are going to get into that. <clears throat> so what is our commitment as Americans, right? Second, as Americans, what is our commitment, right? And so long as old glory unfurls itself as an emblem of the inviolate principles of this constitution of free men, right? So long as old glorious flag 
unfurls itself. Forgive me, I got a mistake there. Unfurls itself as a emblem of the inviolate principles. So as long as this flag represents the principles of the constitution, so long then is our pledge of allegiance to it an inviolate thing. So what the message is teaching us is that Davidians may, America, in, in America, may safely pledge allegiance to this flag as long as this flag stands for or is an emblem of the const the principles of the constitution so that begs the question how long is that when will it be that this that old glory will no longer stand for the principles of the constitution or that the nation itself will no longer respect or honor the principles of the constitution when we know that then we can know how long the videos may safely pledge allegiance let's look further into the um <clears throat> the writings of the spirit of prophecy shepherd's rod volume 2 page 108 it says, <clears throat> as civil powers or governments are symbolized by horns, this particular beast having two, it is evident that the nation represented by this symbol shall have a double form of government, right? So this nation represented by this symbol is depicted over here, and it has a double form of government. As John says, the beast spake as a dragon. It clearly reveals that it is to repudiate its constitution. Oh, really? Yes, this is what's going to happen at this point. In, at some point in time, this beast is to repudiate its constitution. <clears throat> and the God-given liberty of its subjects will be taken away. So God has given liberty to the subjects of this government. And at some point in time, that liberty will be taken away. And that would be, cause, be because of a repudiation of the Constitution. According to Revelation 13 and verse 12, this power is to imitate the beast before him, right? This one right here. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this leopard-like beast in one of its phases was the world under the tyrannical control of the papacy and the people did not have religious liberty rather they were violently and fatally persecuted for any form of supposed dissent so this nation which represents liberty and justice or or in and, and, and manifest liberty and justice will at some point no longer do so and will revert to the beast before it <clears throat> now we are told further in the reading if this great nation there is something that makes the nation great for it to be a great nation. If this great nation should presume upon the conscience of its subjects by legislation, the laws, as to how they may or may not worship, it would be contrary to the provisions in its constitution. Right. So we're getting into say, seeing more about the constitution, speaking as a dragon. 
Quoting the United States Constitution, the First Amendment concerning religious matters states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. If this country should repudiate this amendment, it will completely meet the symbolical specification. So what is the conditional matter? If the country should repudiate the First Amendment, then it would speak as a dragon and would no longer honor the principles of the Constitution. get an additional testimony from the writings of Ellen White, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 451, in paragraph 1. We are told, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness that fully is very important because it shows that the nation is not completely connected to righteousness. And there's many, um, uh, much evidence, and it's very obvious that the nation is not completely connected to righteousness, but, but, yet, but and yet still, it is not fully disconnected from righteousness yet. But, when the decree enforces the institution of the papacy, then she will be disconnected fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution, see, when our, this is going to, what will happen is that every principle of the Constitution will be repudiated under this threefold union. As a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we shall, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. So, th at that time, the principles of the Constitution will be completely done away with. And therefore, God's people would be under no obligation to honor that government. But what is happening prior to that event happening? Hmm. What assurance do we have from the word of God? What guidance do we have from the word of God? Track eight in page 21. Covering Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, it says, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth at the time of the sealing of the 144,000, the message adds. This is John's vision. Holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow, upon the, blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So this angel has told, the angel with the seal has told the other angels that there is no hurting to be done until the servants of God are sealed. Here are brought to view two hurtings about to take place, one by the winds and the other by the angels. 
and the com and the and two commands to the angels, one that they restrain the winds, that the winds blow not on the earth nor on the sea nor any tree. The other that the angels restrain themselves from hurting the earth, sea, and the trees till the servants of God are sealed. So there are two commands given. The command is given to the angels who have power to hurt that they are not to hurt. And the command is also given to those who are holding the winds that they let not the winds go. So what is the significance of all of this to us as Davidians in the context of this issue of government? It says, accordingly, God's restraining of the four winds is his holding back the image of the beast's activity against the saints, holding back the time in which that two-horned beast will exercise the power of the first beast or will repudiate the principles of the Constitution. So God is going to restrain this act until the servants of God are sealed. While his restraining the four angels that they hurt not his holding back the executing of his vengeance upon the sinners who trouble the church until after the sealing of the 144,000 is completed. So the four angels who are to hurt, they're doing a separate work of hurting or destroying the sinners in the church. And he will not allow that until the 144,000 are sealed as well. So what, what is happening is that the 144,000 must be sealed before the church is completely purified and before the government of America apostatizes fully and is no longer eligible to be uh, honored by God's people. So what is happening is that the 144,000 here are guaranteed the time they need and their relationship with the government is locked. That they, as long as they are on this side of the kingdom, they will be obedient. And here we have it in chart form, All right? We see this red arrow leading from the angel with the seal, right? Doing the work of sealing. And we have the, the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 taking place right here. And after that, we start to see that there is a church federation, right? Churches are coming together under um, the um, power of false religion. And we see now that the beast and the false prophet are working together to um, deceive the world and to legislate um, falsehood and repudiate the constitution. And after that, the world is set up, sorry about that, set up to be Babylon. But, God's saints will have already been sealed and taken to the kingdom. Now, what is the other side of the story? Reading from Military Stand, page seven and eight. Knowing full well as we do that the security and sovereign existence of any government depend primarily not on human and military power, but upon divine sufferance and protection, we are consequently still the more compelled to render implicit obedience to heaven's principles governing our duty to our land. Right? So we as Davidians are a blessing to the land. And in so much as we are true Davidians. And we have a duty and obligation to fully 
to be those Davidians because the um the 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 success the prosperity the security and sovereign existence depend upon divine sufferance and protection which depends upon us This high compulsion rests with even more compelling force upon us who have been placed here in providentially free America. So America is providentially free by God's doing. Liberty, religious liberty is here. Why? Because of the happy fact. So we, so, so we have been placed here and we have more of a responsibility. Why? Because of the happy fact that for these last momentous hours of time, he has placed the headquarters of the church here. So the headquarters of the church is in this land and we need to be representing God in this land so that this land can be protected and prosper. And he has placed her here for a reason where she is to enjoy unprecedented li religious liberty. This means religious liberty that has not been offered before. This is what the church is being given now. And the winds are held back and the angels will not hurt until the 144,000 are sealed. She is here to enjoy unprecedented religious liberty. Why? To function freely and to discharge without obstruction her divinely appointed duty worldwide. So the church is here so that she can finish the work, so that she, the headquarters is here, so that we can finish the work. And it's not just the legal liberty, the economic power is also to our benefit so that we may discharge without economic obstruction as well, our divinely appointed duty worldwide. This is why we are located here. And therefore God has made this place a safe haven for the completion of the work. So we see our the importance of our prophetic and geographic placement and our relationship to the government based on that. But it goes even deeper than that. And we are gonna look at the historical foundation of how we got here and why that is important and how it plays into our current situation. Wherefore, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the, resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So let us not resist and receive to ourselves damnation. Let us not resist. We, we shall only resist that which is complex with the law of God. But, but, but all other things we, we resist not. For if we do that, we resist God. We resist the ordinance of God. And we would receive to ourselves damnation. And we are not to resist God's association either. Or his, um, his setting his association in this uh, land. And it's working under the principles of the Constitution, under the principles of the providentially free land and that land's government to do the work. We are not to resist that, that, that function or operation either. Conclusion, true Davidians will honor their respective governments in general. And Davidians in America specifically and his Davidian headquarters, which, which is located in America, will also honor the American government in general and all its just and righteous laws in particular until the work for the church is complete. This protocol and these circumstances 
have been providentially established for us to successfully do just that in this wicked world, wicked spiritual and economic climate. So despite of this, these are my words, by the way, and despite of these this wicked spiritual climate in this wicked world, this has been established. These, these, uh, this protocol and these circumstances of being here and having this relationship with the government, this has been established for us to be successful. Now let's look at some historical foundations. Now, the framers of the Constitution recognize the eternal principle that man's relation with his God is above human legislation and his rights of conscience are inalienable. Now, um, this is coming from the great controversy. So this is Holy Writ. The Holy Writ is saying that the Constitution of the United States recognized that man's relation to his God is above human legislation. So this is a great foundation to be on because this gives man the power to have religious liberty. Reasoning was not necessary to establish this truth. We are conscious of it in our own bosoms. It is the, this consciousness which, in defiance of human laws, has sustained so many martyrs in tortures and flames. So the reason why martyrs were able to um, be tortured and burned was because their con they had a strong conscience and they had a strong faith that their duty to their God was more important than their duty to man. They felt that their duty to God was superior to human enactments and that man could no could exercise, sorry, no authority over their consciences. It is an inborn principle which nothing can eradicate. Amen. And this is what the framers of the Constitution recognize. This is Congressional Documents, USA, serial number 200, uh, document number 271, that the great controversy quote. That's a powerful um, uh, reference to be able to take uh, from a congressional document. As the tidings spread through the countries of Europe of, of a land where every man might enjoy the fruit of his own labor and obey the convictions of his own conscience, thousands flocked to the shores of the new world. So as America was in its burgeoning stage, right? Uh, the people in Europe were attracted to come here. The people who came, they were attracted because they realized that there was civil and religious liberty. Civil liberty, economic liberty, right? We're putting those in the same basket. You can enjoy the fruit of your own labor. So this is not like communism where government's in control of everything, right? You can have property, you can have, you have civil rights, right? Um, that's very attractive, right? And obey the convictions of your own conscience. You're not, you're not dictated to, um, your conscience is not being dictated by a man. So, this is what attracted people. And this, these um, features are going to attract quality people, people who want to be productive and people who want to worship God. And that is a very, very good foundation upon which to found a nation. Colonies rapidly multiplied, right? So one of the uh, features of, of, of having a successful nation, you, you need population. Um, but not just any population, you need people, you need good people who, who are going to work together and, and build up the place. But um, you're going to need population. The America grew fast because of what the, what was being offered. Massachusetts, by special law, offered free welcome and aid at the public cost to Christians of any nationality who might fly beyond the Atlantic to escape from wars or famine or the oppression of their persecutors. Right, so Massachusetts um, went and made it, went out of their way to support Christians. Thus, the fugitive and the downtrodden were, by statute, made the guests of the Commonwealth. In twenty years from the first landing at Plymouth, as many thousands, so, sorry, as many thousand pilgrims were settled in New England. So we see that the population is uh, was 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 starting to build up. Nextly, we're going to go 
uh, page 296, paragraph two, great controversy. To secure the object which they sought, they were content to earn a bare subsistence by a life of frugality and toil. So they wanted their freedom so bad that they were content to just get by. And that was when you're just starting on something, that's what's necessary. You're not going to have um, a lot unless you're coming with a lot. But if you're not coming with much, then you're not going to start off with much, right? So they had to be content with a simple and humble life and one of toil, but they were. They asked nothing from the soil, but the reasonable returns of their own labor. So that's what um, they uh, were receiving. They were receiving the fruits of their labor um, from the soil. They accepted what they got um, in their in their in their product of their of production of food and generally as a symbol of everything else. No golden vision threw a deceitful halo around their path. They were content with the slow but steady progress of their social polity. They patiently endured the privations of the wilderness, watering the tree of liberty with their tears and with the sweat of their brow till it took deep root in the land. So they were, um, they were thankful for their liberty and they endured in order to see the prosperity of liberty in this nation. So it's not that America started off rich and wealthy, bunch of rich, wealthy people. No, that's not it at all. It was hardworking, thrifty, uh, faithful people who established this nation. The Bible was held as the foundation of faith, the source of wisdom and the charter of liberty. So um, they were thankful to be able to have a Bible. They were thankful to be able to have freedom of worship, to, to, to be able to, to worship and to know the Lord and to um and to have this, this unprecedented religious liberty. And they use the Bible to guide them in the way of liberty. Its principles were diligently taught in the home, in the school, and in the church. And its fruits were manifest in thrift, intelligence, purity, and temperance. This is the fruit of the truth. This is the fruit of the Bible. Satan wants the world to believe that um, it is him, his principles, or false science, or just the carnal mind or um, man with, out, with and outside of the Bible that is great. But we know better. We are told differently. We are told that it's the Bible that is the source of wisdom and the fruits of the Bible are thrift, that's being uh, willing and able to survive and be resourceful, intelligence, this, the Bible gives intelligence, purity. This is what we want, the righteousness of Christ, making the right decisions and temperance, moderation. This is the foundation of a successful society. And this is how America was built. One might be for years a dweller in the Puritan settlement and not see a drunkard or hear an oath or meet a beggar. That's amazing. Not a drunkard, not a swear, or even see a beggar. That shows that these, that these people were living Christianity. It was demonstrated that the principles of the Bible are the surest safeguards 
of national greatness. That's it. The feeble and isolated colonies grew to a confederation of powerful states. You see, so this is God's, this is the way God works. God starts small on the principles of the truth and he blesses righteousness. He, he adds multiplication. He, he does multiplication where we do addition and greatness comes out of it. This is how the colonies grew to a confederation of powerful states. And the world marked with wonder the peace and prosperity of a church without a pope and a state without a king. So God was these people's king, right? And the people were the um, were their own governors. It was a republican government. Now, that's not superior to a theocracy, but it's a step in the right direction. Proverbs chapter 14 and 30, verse 34, it says, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. This is something that we must teach our children. It is righteousness which exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. And teaching the history of America is very important for children because they can understand the context of the world they live in. They can understand the reasons why the nation has been exalted, not because of sin, which is what Satan wants to teach them. Show them that it's not so. And then show them that it is falling because of sin, actually. All right. <clears throat> And he had two horns like a lamb. The lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence, and gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States when presented to the prophet as coming up in 1798. Among the, Christ for, among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. So these exiles were determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of, of civil and religious liberty. Their views found place in the Declaration of Independence, which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal, endowed and endowed with the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the Constitution guarantees to the people the right of self-government, providing that representatives elected by the popular vote shall enact and administer the laws. Freedom of religious faith was also granted, every man being permitted to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. So that's republicanism and religious liberty. That was what was granted in the Constitution. And they um, recognized the right that could not be taken away from one to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Republican and Republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and prosperity. What? Yes, nothing else. It's the principles of Republicanism and Protestantism. The civil and religious liberty. That is the secret. Note that it's a secret. It's not even well understood, but as true Davidians, we are to understand this. The secret of its power and prosperity are the principles of civil and religious liberty. Because the right to self-government <clears throat> gives the people their um, their their right to choose their own um, a destiny, right? It 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 guards against um, despotism, right? Which ends up going into the devil's hands to uh, work wickedness in the country, and and often, if not all of the time, to eradicate Christianity, which is the um, source of success the true source, the Bible, right? And religious liberty gives one the opportunity to serve God in the fullness. And that uh, working as the foundation, it works in the society 
to create success because it's righteousness that exalts a nation. And we can see that because when we're in the kingdom, it's the righteousness of the saints that will make the kingdom a happy place and the new earth a happy place and a, and a good place. And that's what makes the rest of the universe a good place. <clears throat> the difference is, is that kingdom saints have the mind of God under theocracy. So their um, government and their ideas are perfect without an error. But this is a um, a lesser, republicanism is a lesser of the evils that um, exist in this world in terms of government. Like if it was under, for instance, as opposed to communism or any form of despotism. All right, last sentence. The oppressed and downtrodden throughout Christendom have turned to this land with interest and hope. Millions have sought its shores. You see, see what's happening? It's people who are um, ambitious, right? And who want to be in agreement with these principles. Um, not all. And so over time, the nation was, you know, has become corrupted. But in its foundation, it received enough of these people to really set up a powerful country. Millions have saw its shores, and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. That is actually a miracle. Whether we see that or not. Now, <clears throat> just to do a, um, have a little chart here so that we can understand what it is that we're dealing with. We have just in a, in a brief way, all men are created equal with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? That's the uh, principle and declaration of independence. This is a principle that leads to the U.S. Constitution, right? The, the, the laws that cannot be changed, the legal foundation of the nation, right? The Constitution establishes two things, republicanism and Protestantism, right? Protestantism, um, um, uh, is believes or expresses or holds a principle of religious liberty. So a Protestant government is going to give one religious liberty. Republicanism, right, is about self-government. So it's going to, it's 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 rooted in the principle of civil liberty. So it's going to grant one civil liberty. And this is the secret of the nation's prosperity and power right here. And liberty and justice for all. Also um, confirmed and validated in track 13. Now, we needed to establish that foundation, but now we can get into trademark law, all right? Um, we needed to establish that foundation of understanding the context of where we are and the importance of civil and religious liberty. And now we're gonna look at how trademark law for, um, plays into that. What is a trademark copyright? or patent, right? So this is directly from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And um, <clears throat> we're gonna focus on trademarks. So um, in their publication, they're, they're answering this question. What is a trademark or service mark? It says a trademark is generally a word or phrase, word, phrase, or symbol. Word, phrase, sorry, symbol or design or a combination thereof that identifies and distinguishes the source of the goods of one party from those of others. So you have a source identifier, whether it's a word, phrase, symbol, or design, or combination, it identifies the source, right? And a service mark, similar, but it's about a service. So goods and services are what, um, you know, was what an economy is uh, comprised of, is goods, goods and services right, at the basic level. Now, a trademark can be any word, phrase, symbol, design, or combination of these things that identifies your goods or services. It's how customers recognize you in the marketplace and distinguish you from other competitors. Now, um, 
what's really important about this is that um, humans have to be able to distinguish one company or organization from another, right? Um, they, 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 we need to be able to, to make a choice based on whatever principles that we want. And that goes back into civil liberty. So we're going to show how all of this is interconnected in one system, right? So um, it, th there's some bullet points right here that talks about the features of a trademark, right? And we know that identifying the source of goods and services, right? Goods or services. Now, legal protection. Um, this is an important part because um, one's brand needs to be uh, distinct in order for an economy to function. We're going to look into that more, function uh, optimally, right? Or even for that person to, to really have their own civil um, liberty, right? Um, and we, we need to be able to, to, to deal with counterfeiting and fraud, and we're going to see why. Now, those are um, the key, the key um, aspects and features, right? So we're going to look at some practical um, examples right here. So we see these brands. These are brands that most of us are probably familiar with, right? Crest toothpaste. We have these um, soft, these soft drink sodas. Obviously, they're not for Davidian consumption, but we just, for the purpose of the business analysis, we're going to do, we're looking at them, right? Coca-Cola, Fanta, Sprite, Starbucks coffee, Adidas, uh, sportswear, um, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, coffee and donuts, and Kit Kat. These are um, chocolate candy bars, right? So we're aware of these brands, right? Um, now, let's look at them as an example of the manifestation of this issue, right? So why should one register for a trademark? Now, one of the um, doubts and objections that Satan has devised is that why would the association obtain a trademark? Well, of all the list of things that exist here, we are focused on this one, this red box right here. It says legal presumption, right? The law will presume that you own the trademark and have the right to use it. So in the environment, the legal environment, one who has a trademark has the right to use it. And what is our trademark? The Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association. Would we want to, the law to protect our rights to use that? Absolutely. We need it to do so. We need it to do so. Right? And there are huge problems with counterfeiting and fraud. And we're going to get into that. Now, we saw the true brands, right? You see the true brands. Now I'm going to give I'm looking at some snippets of the fake brands you have right here. Crust toothpaste, toothpaste, crust. Right, not crest, crust, just a letter off. You have Fonty instead of Fanta, Cola instead of Coca-Cola and Sprunty instead of Sprite. You have Stars Coffee. Logo looks very similar to Starbucks. Stars Coffee. Reportedly, this is in Russia. You have Abibas, not Adidas. Abibas. Uh, right, sneaker here. Donkey Donuts. Not Dunkin' Donuts. Donkey Donuts, similar coloring. And Cat Cop. Not Kit Kat. Now this Kit Kat box looks really similar to that Kit Kat box. Kit Kat box. See, I see. You see, I'm getting confused because I call it Kit Kat. This is the Kit Kat box. That's the Kit Kat box, right? So, what does all of this have to do with God? Remember, God is the head of all just governments and laws, and he has sent governors for the punishment of evildoers. And his law says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 309, paragraph 3, says false speaking in any matter. Every attempt or purpose to deceive our neighbor is here included. An intention to deceive 
is what constitutes falsehood. So are these intending to deceive? Yes. Yes, these are intending to deceive or irresponsibly going about um, making a differentiation. An intention to deceive is what constitutes falsehood. By a glance of the eye, a motion of the hand, expression of the countenance, a falsehood may be told as effectually as by words. So if you brand your product same way, you have a similar wording, this and that, all of that still constitutes falsehood. All intentional overstatement, every hint or insinuation calculated to convey an erroneous or exaggerated impression, even the statement of facts in such a manner as to mislead as falsehood. Even if you state in facts, this precept forbids every in effort to injure our neighbor's reputation by misrepresentation. Right. Or what about um, to um, steal from our neighbor's, uh, rep our neighbor's reputation by misrepresentation, right? These violators or these counterfeit brands are breaking the principle of this commandment or evil surmising or by, by slander or by tailbearing. Even the intentional suppression of truth by which injury may result to others is a violation of the ninth commandment. So God is, seek, wouldn't, is seeking to protect and uphold the ninth commandment because his law is the foundation of the, the universe. So if we break in all our good laws are a subset, a particular application of the, the broad principles of the Ten Commandments. So this is what trademark law is addressing. Violation of trademark law is bearing false witness. A true trademark infringer is misrepresenting themselves to the consumer and trading off of the value of another brand, which is a form of deception and stealing, by the way. Even if the branding is confusingly similar, but not intentionally deceptive, it is still unlawful because it hinders the consumer's ability to obtain a product or service from the desired source. And robs the producer of the value they have created for themselves as the source of a certain good or service. So the consumer right, is in the difficult situation of having, of, um, of being, of possibly getting something from somewhere where they did not intend to get it from, and it may not be the one that they wanted to get, right? The work of deception is going on. And then for the, the true source, they are losing their business that they have gained, that they have gained by their reputation, which was earned by their work, their product. Right. So on one hand, civil liberty requires protection and fraud and counterfeiting in order for people to really have civil liberty, right? Businesses and organizations cannot operate optimally with an environment which allows counterfeits and an economy cannot function optimally without distinct source identifications in the marketplace, right? It is indeed a civil right to have an, an identity and property. You want to have your identity for your organization or for yourself and have property um, intellectual or otherwise, intellectual property is important property to be able 
if you're going to have civil liberty, right, true liberty in civil society, you need to be able to have your own property, even if it's intellectual, especially if it's intellectual, your ideas, your brand, your concept, your service, whatever you're doing for the world, being able to own that is an essential feature um, of a prosperous society. Conversely, consumers should have the right to choose what they want to purchase from whom they like to purchase free from deception. Now, um, <clears throat> this can be more severely seen in a market for something like automobiles, something that's highly technical and um, the product quality can range greatly and makes a, a very significant um, impact on the consumer's experience. So if a consumer is desires to get a car from a certain manufacturer because or um, because they know of the quality or a certain model of that car, because they know the quality, it has the features that they need and everything, right? But a counterfeit comes into the market, right? And um, they are not able to distinguish that consumer could be robbed severely in their mind. They could be deceived and robbed. I mean, in reality, they were deceived in their mind and robbed in reality. Now, um, we have the Range Rover and the Chinese version, the Land Wind. Now, it looks very similar, right? Looks very, very similar. I asked um, the kids, which one do they think is the original one? And they picked the Chinese one three times. Again, they picked it three times, the Chinese one, right? Without knowing the background or context. But um, if there, if let's say that there is no trademark law, whatever, whatsoever, and somebody can just put Range Rover as you put Range Rover and they can just put Range Rover, what's happening? That's mayhem, that's chaos. Now you're buying something that you think is a Range Rover, uh, you drive it for a year and it, and it falls apart and you realize it's not a Range Rover. So in an economic number, we're talking about liberty and justice for all. Is that justice? No. In an economic environment which does not have trademark law, businesses in the long run lose the incentive to create quality products and add value to the market. In fact, without trademark law, there's no barrier to complete imitation and the elimination of the incentive to create good products. On the consumer side, the deception will lead to false choices and an unnecessary inhibition, uncertainty in making future purchasing decisions. So now consumers have to go do extra work. This is adding transaction costs. This is making the economy less efficient. Now that the consumer has to go through all this to try to verify that the, the, the source. Thus, trademark law allows for fair trade. A law against such transgressions is indeed for the punishment of evildoers. So this is how a Davidian has to think. A Davidian has to be a close reasoner and a logical thinker. Now, that's one side of it, right? But there could be abuse too. On the other hand, civil and religious liberty requires that one can have their own individual business or organization brand, so they may fully and completely trade freely. So if somebody wants to start a photography company, and there's already a photography company out, like um, James's, um, Skyview Photography Company, okay, but, um, you know, Sharon wants to start a, um, uh, a, a Sharon, Sharon Beautiful Images um, Photography Company. Sharon should have the right to start that company that is based on her own brand, her own product, and her own um, intentions, right, and vision. That is um, optimal fair fairness, right? That is optimal justice. But her doing that is different from attempting to counterfeit or trade off of another brand's fame, right? She has her own distinct brand, right? Because she has her own thing that she wants to offer to the market. This is exercising the right to have a separate and distinct brand product or service. She is exercising that right in that example, and everyone in a free land has that right. 
So look at another example. You have Kentucky Fried Chicken, big um, brand, right? A big famous uh, franchise, right? Now for somebody to try to mock it up and put um, KFFC or you know KCC or whatever have the same color, same design, and stuff like that. Okay, that's um, that's a a form of counterfeiting deception. But if somebody wants to start one called Popeyes, have different brand, different everything, but they want to have their own chicken company, they should be free to do that and to compete and to offer their own stuff, right? Now, what about God's association? Should God's association be able to have their own organization offer their own products, literature, Bible studies, videos, podcasts, music. Should God's association be able to do that? Yes, because God's association is offering its own um, product and services under its own brand. It has its own message, right? The shepherd's rod message. That's not the same as the messages of other churches or groups, it has the raw message. So this is a distinct and separate message that is being brought to the market for those who are interested or are possibly interested in being saved into God's kingdom. Those who are making an investment into eternal life. So this is the most important market as it were. Now, if somebody receives literature from or goes to a website with um, a, a brand or sees products with these symbols on it, would that would that individual be confused as to um, where uh, if as to whether this source is different from the goods and services? of another organization when they see the term Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association and they see these symbols, right? This this rod right here with leaves on it. Um, we see the different um, uh, uh, graphic designs and we see the term Davidian, right? And we know that churches have distinct names based on their doctrines. Would somebody be confused as to whether this is the same as um, another church? No, that's not likely. This organization is God's organization and it has the right, just like all the other organizations, to display, to produce its own product and services to the market, to do its work, to reach the brethren in the church and in the world. It has the right to do that. And it is providentially located in the United States of America so that it may benefit from civil and religious liberty. Therefore, all altogether, therefore, we see that while on one hand, a man's disloyalty to the divine government is a sin against God. On the other hand, his disloyalty to his nation's government is a sin against it. Also indirectly against God. So the one who is opposing the associations uh, ben benefiting from trademark law um, um, or against it in principle, or violating in any way, but they, those individuals, right? They, they got freedom to express certain things, but to be opposed to God and his association is a sin against him, right? And for those who feel they don't have to obey and they can violate it and they can make counterfeits or they can um, lie to, to, um, to abuse or misuse or misrepresent, they're sinning against him. And if they and if they're um, 
counterfeiting, then they're sinning against the government and against him. That's why we need to be in the middle of the road. We need to be close reasoners and logical thinkers. For disloyalty to one's government is disobedience to God's express command. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto all governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. That's what they are sent for and for the praise of them that do well. So the government is also there to support those that do well. And by God's grace, the government does and will support his vanguard association in well-doing in spreading the gospel of the kingdom and adding life to the nation and to the world. <clears throat> but the critical, the skeptical, and the doubting, this is the same as the what we saw earlier in the prayer thought, the selfish, the proud, and the lovers of sin. The critical, the skeptical, and the doubting will find many hooks, not just a few, many hooks upon which to hang their doubts. All kinds of things to, to, to complain and criticize and oppose the association concerning. Nevertheless, we have this assurance from God. Nevertheless, the honest ones, the Vanguard material, the true Davidians, the little flock, his, his true sheep, the honest ones, will shun the devil, amen? Will shun the devil by embracing the facts. The facts are shown in the weight of evidence. The facts are in the study. And by walking in the light, so they will embrace the facts and they'll walk in the light. They will they'll be loyal to God's true association. God bless you all. I pray that this was a blessing and I pray that you all tune in for part two <clears throat> as we get deeper into this subject. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and glory for this study. We pray that you would bless um, all those who hear that they may understand and fortify themselves <clears throat> to by your power to be in this vanguard. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat>